Hello there, Bro Steph here, and this is Prophecy Insights and Bible Insights. Today I was listening to Pastor John MacArthur talk about uh, hell, and also he discussed in another video, which by the way, I'd recommend you watch both of these. Uh, you can find them on my profile page at Facebook. Um, also, he talked about prayer and how we should pray. Now, now both of these issues are very important, especially today um, with what we're surrounded with in the world today. People need to know that hell is a real place. People need to know how to pray. Uh, because when all heck breaks loose, prayer is what's going to end up getting us through and through prayer, God has the unique ability to guide us, lead us, direct us through prayer and the reading of his word. But today, we're not going to talk about that. Today, while I was listening to those two videos, it dawned on me that we're not responsible for changing the world. That's not what Jesus asked us to do. He didn't ask us to change the world. He didn't ask us to change people. That's not our responsibility. That's actually his. But he did in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, he did lay out what he wants us to do in regards to our relationship with him and our relationship reaching out to the world and the people in the world, those that don't know him. But isn't it interesting, you know, when you think about it, it's not my job to change anybody. It's not my job to grab the world by the tail and try to change it. It's not my job to be overly involved in the political debates of this world. I'm not a politician. I wasn't called to be a congressman, a senator, a president, or a diplomat, or whatever the case may be. You and I are called to be ambassadors of Christ and because we're called to be ambassadors, it's our responsibility to share the gospel with the world and with people in the world who don't know the Lord. That's our calling. It's really simple when you think about it. Let's read. Let's, um, let's look at chapter the first chapter of Acts. Uh, Father, we ask that as we read your word, you'll open our eyes and our hearts. You'll open our understanding. And you'll give us the wisdom by your Holy Spirit to understand what the word of God is saying to us and what Jesus wanted us to understand, and it's in his name, the name of Jesus, Yeshua, that we pray and we thank you that you've heard our prayer and that you'll answer it. Amen. Okay. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, 
until the day in which he was taken up. After he threw the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Pause right there. Let's do, like Psalm says, a selah. Let's pause and think about it for a second. So here Jesus went to the cross, died for the sins of the world, suffered a agonizing uh, death and, and shed his blood for the remission of sin for anyone that would believe in him. He became the once and for all Passover sacrifice. And he's appearing for 40 days to the people. He's doing miracles. He's teaching the word of God. And he, the, the Lord, you know, after his resurrection, starts to do the very things that he was doing before he went to the cross. Didn't miss a step. Just starts reengaging all over again. Bam, and does what he is called to do. And you notice with the Lord, he focuses like a laser beam only on what his responsibility is. He doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. He doesn't try to mix his mission doesn't try to mix it up with all these other kinds of things he should be doing. He stays focused on the task at hand. So we go to verse 4. And being assembled together with them. Now, here the Lord is actually assembled with the apostles. And I'm sure there were probably people that followed him that were there. And uh, people, their minds had to have just been rocked. Because here they saw him on the cross dead. They saw him take his last breath. They saw him in the tomb. And now here he is for 40 days. And 40 nights ministering to the people. There he is in the flesh, speaking to them, eating with them. I'm sure they said, how can these things be in their own minds? How, how can this be? It probably rocked them to their very core. So he's assembled with them in Jerusalem. And he tells them to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, based on the fact that you're going to be baptized with fire from the Holy Spirit. When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Listen to what Jesus says. Very interesting. And he said, this is Jesus, said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
Now, what the Lord does is he focuses them like a laser beam on the mission, <coughs> excuse me, at hand. He basically says to him, it's not your business uh, when God the Father is going to wrap up the end of the age. It, I mean, it's right here in black and white. The Lord said, it's really not any concern of yours. The Father's going to take care of that. You focus on sharing the gospel, sharing me and all you've seen and all you've heard me talk on and preach about and all the healings I've done and the miracles I've done. Share me with the people. That's your mission. When we get a hold of what God is asking us to do, and we really get that fixed in our hearts and minds, it pushes all the clutter and all the noise aside. Wait, Lord, you mean you're calling me to be a living witness to people? In other words, the way I live, the way I talk, the way I think, the way I act should be representative of you? That's basically my responsibility in you? That's my mission? Yeah. You know, back in 1987, I studied Bible prophecy like a maniac. I mean, I was really into it, and I taught it in home Bible studies and all this stuff. And in fact, to this day, I still keep an eye on it uh, because I want to know if what the Bible has said about what's coming, if our society is drawing closer to those times that the Bible has already predicted. So I keep my eye on it. But many of you who have followed me, let's say since the year 2000, and there's a lot here on Facebook that started listening to what I shared on the internet when the internet was barely the internet, um, you know, all those years ago. And now you notice that I'm doing, as I get older, I feel this urgency in my heart to encourage people to really share the Lord Jesus Christ with those around them. The world is headed in a direction where I believe that the time will come, possibly in our lifetimes, and, no, and I put that in parentheses, possibly in our lifetimes, when our, our ability to share the gospel is going to be curtailed by the losing of our freedoms and our religious liberties. I think that day is drawing closer Will it happen in my lifetime? I'm 65. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a couple of years, 20 years, 30 years. I don't know. So rather than me worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, I want to be concerned about sharing Jesus today. And if I make that a priority in my heart, like I'm doing here, I'm sharing the Lord and his word with you. And this is going to re reach out through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, it's going to reach, you know, probably a couple hundred people. And some are going to go, wow, I like that. Some are going to say, eh. you know, I don't know. And maybe one or two people 
who've been thinking about asking the Lord into their life will actually do that and be born again because we're sharing the Word of God with people. And that's the only way people get saved, if you want to know the truth, is by the sharing of the Word of God, the words of Jesus. Jesus is the living personification of the Word of God. You want to know what the Word of God teaches? Look at Jesus Christ and get a firm grasp on him. He is the Word of God. That's one of his titles. It's one of his names, the Word of God. You find that in the book of Revelation. And he said to them, I'll repeat it, it's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. When we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes into us and renews, Romans chapter 12, our minds. And it's at that point we start thinking differently, acting differently, behaving differently. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to do, are you ready? One thing, share Jesus with those around us. That's the empowering. That's why the Lord puts the Holy Spirit in us to give us that boldness and that confidence to share Jesus with those around us. Now, how you share Jesus with those around you, that's between you and the Lord. Though, you know, maybe you teach a home Bible study. Maybe you get two or three uh, new, new born-again believers in your kitchen around your coffee table, and you have a cup of coffee together, open the Word of God, and talk and share and pray. I mean, anything like that can be just wonderful, a wonderful tool in sharing Jesus with those around you. And, you know, then they get built up in their faith, and they go out and duplicate what you did with them. And that's called making disciples, right? So we share the gospel with people. They ask Christ into their life. Now it's, it's the job of those of us that are sharing the gospel to disciple them, to teach them, to encourage them, and to help them in their walk with the Lord. And between you and me, I don't think we do. We have fallen down on that part of our, our responsibility. We haven't done a good job with that in the church. And we're still not doing a good job. I mean, even back in the 80s, you know, we were great at filling these big arenas. And then lots of people would come to the Lord, but we were horrible in follow-up and getting people discipled and and helping them in their walk with the Lord. We were horrible at doing that. So that's why I say, just get two believers at your coffee table, you and two other believers, that's three of you, have some coffee, maybe, you know, I know this isn't very healthy, but hey, you got to live a little bit. Have some cookies or some donuts on the table, or if you want to keep it healthy, do it, fruit, whatever you want to do. But uh, have a little fellowship. And that's a mini little church where two or more are gathered. Jesus promised, I'll be right there with you. And so you do that, and uh, there's Gwen. Gwen, how are you, Gwen? Good to see you. I'm doing great. I hope your afternoon is, is good, too. So, yeah, so you have this little gathering, right? That's a church. You encourage one another, and then hopefully they'll grow, go out and do the same thing or something similar. Hey, 
maybe you're a newspaper guy, you know, or something. And you know how they take those stacks? Of, well, I guess they don't do newspapers anymore, do they? You know, I used to throw those when my buddy, uh, Brent, went on his summer vacation with his family. I took over his route for him for a month. And that was fun, folding up the papers, put them in the bag, put it on your bike, and boom, boom, go out there and do it. Well, if you were a believer, you could tuck a track into the paper and throw it out there to the people, right? Well, you could take a track today and just put it in people's mailboxes. Just a single track. You know, the seven steps to spiritual growth or Something like that. Pastor J.D. Frog in Hawaii has a thing on his website now where someone volunteered their services uh, where they'll send out a big postcard. And it's anonymous, so no one knows who it came from. And it's got the ABCs of salvation on it and some other things to just kind of discuss why it's important to ask Christ into their lives. And they'll send out a couple of these a week for you. You just go to the website, plug in the person's address, their name, and bam, and out they go. A literal postcard with a stamp, you know, the whole nine yards. And that's a free service. They do not charge for it. So that's another way. So you can share Christ. There's all kinds of ways today. You can do it through email, through text. You can do all kinds of things. Um, but I love this verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and of the earth. And then let's wrap this up with this. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, you know that cloud was the Shekinah, the Shekinah cloud, the Shekinah glory of God swooped up, down under him, around him, covered him, and up to heaven he went in the Shekinah glory of God. That's what that cloud was. It's the same cloud that followed the children of Israel in, in the wilderness and shaded them from the heat. It's the same cloud. It was the Shekinah glory of God. See, God can't show you his face. If he showed you his face in its purest form, you would die because sin cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. And we are sinners saved by grace. So he has to cover himself in that Shekinah glory to protect you and me. That's an interesting thought, right? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner, as you saw him go into heaven. So it's like they're looking, they're looking, at, uh, the angels looking on at the apostles, and they're all like, their mouths wide open. You know, they're just like, wow, right? And they're going, hey, what, what are you doing? Staring up at, you know, Jesus is coming back the same way. So let's get busy and do what he asked us to do. Let's start sharing the gospel. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's get on with the program, folks. 
Let's do what the Lord Jesus asked us to do. Look, he died and suffered and, sh and, and was tortured, unbelievably so. So we could have the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, and the boldness through the Holy Spirit to be able to share him with a dying world. The world needs Jesus more than they ever have before, right now. Now, God has given us a, a field that is ripe and ready to ask Christ into their lives. The field of wheat is ready. They're ready to say yes to Jesus if we only share him with them. Now, not everyone will say yes. In fact, the majority will look at you like you're crazy, but that's okay. Look, I'm crazy just normally. I'm a little nutty. You know, my, my family, all Jews, myself included, right? They would call me Meshuggah. In fact, I got called that a lot growing up. It's a little Meshuggah stuff, a little Meshuggah, a little crazy, a little on the edge, a little different, not quite like the rest of us. But you know what? It serves me well. So that if I share Christ with someone, they already see me as a little different. So when I do something different, it's no big deal, right? Fits in rather nicely to the agenda. So share Jesus with people. Find creative ways to do it. Like go to Pastor uh, JD's website, JD Frog F R A. G, I believe. Let me look it up for you real quick. Uh, J.D. Farag. Yeah, uh, F-A-R-A-G dot org. J.D. F-A-R-A-G dot org. And I believe that will get you there. Uh, let's see here. Yes, jdfarag.org. It'll get you right to his homepage. I'm looking at it right now. And um, you have to click up on the, I think there are three, it's called a hamburger, three little lines that go horizontally on top of each other. You click on that or click on the menu, and uh, right there you can, you know, start sending out those postcards. So anyway, look, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I wanted to encourage you today to get focused on the task at hand. And that is to be a living witness for Jesus Christ and to consider creative ways in sharing your faith with those around you because the alternative is very scary. And, it, you know, look, when a soul is condemned to hell and it's, as the Bible says, it's a place of darkness, a place of loneliness, of pain and untold suffering, separation from God, separation from loved ones, completely lonely and by yourself in this darkness. And you have to live for eternity in your own thoughts and, in, and suffer pain for eternity. When you think that that's the alternative, that should give us all the motivation we need. Not to mention that the Lord wants us to share our faith. 
to share our faith with those around us and ask people to repent of their sins and to ask Jesus Christ to be their Lord and their Savior. Romans Romans uh, I, my mind went blank. Romans I believe it's isn't it 10, 9 and 10? Let me see real quick. Romans 10. Yeah. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That's what people need to do. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Whoever believes on him, Jesus, will not be put to death. Well, I'm sorry, will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. So I'll leave you with that. Share your faith. Keep looking up. Jesus is going to return. Earn. This is Bro Stuff. See you again next time. Make it a great rest of the day. Bye for now.